Okay, so today I set myself the ambitious goal of explaining all functions of D modules, then when I was writing the lecture, it's absolutely impossible. So what I'm going to explain today is connections and pullback, and I'm going to spend quite a lot of time uh, explaining connections because I feel that like I'm by no means an expert on D modules and probably in my life, I've pulled back about 10 D modules actually by hand and, and saw what I got. Okay? So I haven't done that many pullback, <laughs> but somehow it's always a pain in the book. Like it's universally a pain in the neck. And then suddenly this time I started pulling that connection and I could do like five examples in 10 minutes and I was so happy. Right? So I want to explain to you how to pull back connection so you can actually do nice examples. And I'm kind of shocked that these examples are not in the standard accounts. Because uh, I find them incredibly enlightening. And uh, yeah, so that's the point. I just want to explain what connections are, um, explain how to pull them back, and then explain how that. that and I also want to explain why a D module is um, a quasi coherent sheet where we can differentiate. It's very important. Important uh, concept. And also, um, I realized that in a perfect world, everybody has um, seen a really good two semester course on differential geometry and is totally happy with connections and, um, and curvature and things like that, but that is not the reality. And so I'm just gonna give a kind of five or five to 10 minute recollection of a two semester course on differential geometry. Okay. So uh, motivation for differential geometry. Okay, so we have that whole. And you can make sense of what a vector field is going on. So here's my manifold, which I'm imagining is a sphere. And it's a round sphere. And then I have um, on the side a vector field. And this is the same thing as a continuous choice of tangent vector at every point. This is the same thing as a section of tangent bundle. And then there's a beautiful kind of algebraic fact. This is the same thing as a derivation of the same thing function So that's what a vector field is. And this vector field you can you can see see is giving us a very simple differential equation on our manifold, namely, like, you know, at this point, I want to go in this direction. And because this differential equation is so simple, we can always solve it. And so we get x psi t is the flow along. So the, diff the derivative of this uh, of this flow. So if I have a flow on a manifold and I take a derivative, I get a vector field. And so the derivative of this vector of this flow is my vector field. Yeah. So I'm thinking about I'm moving in my in my space. And if I take the derivative of that, I get a point off in my tangent band and I recover my vector field. And then we have the our um, lead bracket, so given vector fields of psi and psi prime, we have the lead bracket. Last time, this is the lead bracket of vector fields. And I mean, I just find it so beautiful how everything kind of has a geometric and then an algebraic interpretation. So the geometric interpretation of the lead bracket of vector fields is the Failure of flowing along psi and psi prime to be it measures failure of flow along psi and psi prime to continue. And it is also so that's the geometric meaning of the lead bracket of two vector fields. And it also has a beautiful algebraic, um, and it's the commutator of the derivations. Okay. 
So if you want a beautiful, like a, a beautiful example of this, there's the sphere, and you can consider the vector fields given by rotation around the three principal axes. And now, imagine that I try to commute. So I want to convince you that flowing along um, this vector field and this vector field doesn't do. So if I start here and I flow along this vector field, it's fixed. Okay? And then I flow along the other side, I go in this direction. Whereas if I go in the other direction, then I go around here and then. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Anyway, thought like it's a, it's a beautiful exercise to think about. And what you get is the um, the, the, the commutation relation to the SO3. Yeah, the size, the, the what do they call it? X, X thing in basic vector cat. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so, you know, like if you want to think about this, it's really not an example. You guys. And um, also, Yeah, and that's that's it. So now, uh, if I have a Riemannian manifold, then now it makes sense. To differentiate a section of the tangent bundle in a particular direction. Makes sense to section. In a direction to a bundle. And this gives rise to. So, what do I mean by that? So, imagine that here's my metal, and then here I have a tangent vector. And I can imagine a path, another tangent vector. And now imagine that I have continuous family tangent vectors sticking out along that path. It makes sense to take the derivative along here. And if that derivative is zero, this is telling me that I'm parallel transporting my okay. So this gives rise to parallel transport. Along. So, so generally we denote this number of psi, which is some thing that takes in a section the tangent bundle and skips out another section. Okay, which is the derivative of that section of the tangent bundle along psi. And the really important thing that this gives you, which we see, like we see time and time again, is that as if I have this path gamut, I have a fixed identification of these two things. So gamma is an identification of. And this is parallel transport. So, Jordi, can you just repeat why the Romanian structure gives you the ability to do this? So then, 
I mean, like I'll explain in a second what a what a connection is, and the Riemannian Riemannian structure gives rise to this nebulous which allows you to differentiate sections. Oh, okay. okay. But it's incredibly important to think through. So, you know, I'm not sure if people know this story, but Riemann was, you know, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. And he, um, you know, I, I said last time that he proved this um, Riemann mapping theorem by this Dirichlet principle. So basically, like very soft argument, soft argument that some PDE has a mix. So without kind of prescribing it, um, without like really solving Huggies, this is the solution. And he did like absolutely, I think he, he, he didn't publish much, but everything that he published is absolutely extraordinary. And he was um, not a professor, he was a private docent. And what that meant is that he could charge for lectures that he didn't get a salary. So you would go to lectures of the and you'd walk in and you'd put your 20 whatevers, you know, tin can, I imagine, and listen to the lecture of Bingman, and then uh, and then finally, um, and he was very sick and he kept having to go to Italy to try to recover from tuberculosis. And when he was in Italy, he met Betty and explained to Betty that what Betty got me to but anyway, and then at some point, uh, the Göttingen said, okay, they know you can become a professor, but to give it to become a professor, you have to give that habilitation for it. And Riemann said, sure. And he gave Gauss three topics. And he was told, so two topics were, were quite similar to the stuff that he'd been working on. I think at this stage, he'd already written, I'm not sure about this, at this stage, I'm pretty sure at this stage, he'd already written this. Famous paper giving the Riemann hypothesis, for example, and um, and then his third topic was quite um, kind of off the beaten track. It was basically he said, "I want to explain the fundamental assumptions that underlie geometry." And Gauss said, "I want to hear that lecture." And um, and the resulting writing is an absolutely extraordinary thing to read. If you wanted to wanted to read a really really good the writing. Like that. Is. So he explains that what curvature is on a general domain. Yeah. So Gauss had the Gauss curvature of embedded um, surfaces inside our tree, what we call Gauss curvature. Um, and Riemann explained what it means on a manifold. And by the way, Gauss um, came up with curvature because he was measuring Germany. And somehow the triangles didn't quite work out. And then he realized that already Germany did enough to go to the curvature of the earth. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Riemann basically you know, explained that on a manifold, in order to have a measuring stick, you have to have a definite form on your tangent space. This is what we call a Riemannian metric. And then this structure leads to many things, in particular the ability to differentiate sections. Which is usually today expressed in units. Never should be done. Um, and so, you know, in, in Raymond's work, it's clear that if we don't have a Riemannian structure, we do not have a way of identifying the tangent space. They're, they're the same dimension, we're on a manifold, but there's no canonical way of identifying these. And Raymond explains when we have a path, and we have a, um, and we have a metric, and we can do this. So that's um, very nice. And then, uh, so the other thing that this leads to is, um, is a lot of, okay, so if you're on a sphere and you do a tiny loop around here and you parallel transfer around that loop, you get a tiny rotation. And this generates a whole lot of So every tangent space has this interesting subgroup of um, SOA order, which is the subgroup that's generated by all these infinitesimal movements. So Joe, Joe and I had an amazing um, illustration of this in that 
uh, someone has actually like worked out how to depict hyperbolic space um, inside of VR heads. Okay, so you can walk around hyperbolic free space in a VR headset, and we were on the eighth floor of the castle, and you put it on, and you do this, you keep doing this, right? <laughs> and as you look at me, I just keep doing this like a madman with my VR headset on. But in my world, I'm slowly rotating around. And that's how long it's totally yeah. So it is the me. So I hope this picture accurately explains the me. <laughs> um, and you have the um, curvature. Which is the... Uh, sorry. Yeah, so I've said... Now, what is this thing? So this is the um, this is the Lehman coach tensor. So the way to think about this thing, I think, is that basically, if I give you two, so imagine that I I have two vector fields. So I have psi and psi. And in the neighborhood of a point, we can assume that um, that these two, that this lead bracket term is zero. So if I just take a chart on my manifold and then just use my coordinates to my chart, then the lead brackets of all my vector fields um, are zero. Yeah. So these are I've chosen them as orthogonal orthogonal to the two. And so what I do is I I had a parallel transport in a little in a little rectangle. So, um, so this is I'm not sure how this is usually the different over the nose. So this is R um psi psi. And what this is, is this is a machine that takes in two tangent vectors and spits out an endomorphism of my tangent space. So here are my two tangent vectors, which are fixed. And then I, I plug in a tangent vector and I go, I do parallel transport around that. And that gives me another vector. So it's like a it's a thing that the curvature tensor sort of eats two tangent vectors and produces an endomorphism of the tangent space. That's a pretty complicated high-dimensional tensor. And this is the fact that somehow this is what everyone realized is that curvature in High dimension depends on many, many brackets. Yeah. And if this is zero, then this is called a flat. This is called a flat. Okay. Which tells you that the, um, a lot of them. And another way of saying flat is the parallel transport. Only depends on the home of the bar. So that's the very brief, but much longer than five minutes. Recollection of um of, of different okay. uh, And this is not meant to be easy, but I think it's important to have in mind when understanding this. And I should say I'm far from an expert in different geometry. Are there any questions about that stuff? So I, I really liked the idea of if you if the lead bracket of two vector fields vanishes, this is like the front and parallel transport around the little infinitesimal uh, rectangle, yeah. rectangle. But what should I think geometrically about the condition that the two vector fields have vanishing lead brackets? You just should think that this is like you're just working in a coordinate chart. So any coordinate chart will have vanishing lead brackets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, 
Anything. Exactly. Yeah. If I take a coordinate chart and I choose the coordinate derivatives. Okay. Yeah. So somehow I think about this like vanishing Lie bracket is always achievable locally and probably not globally. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right. So now I want to kind of. So, like, if you just think about classic differential geometry, parallel transport depends on the metric. So, what that tells you is that there's no God given way to differentiate sections without a metric. It's very important. Yeah. And now I want to explain in the world of geometry why there's no God given way to differentiate sections. Okay. And um, I just want to do this slightly sketchily. So let's say that we have U and F1 right. And we take U times C the trivial. So here's you, and here's a trivial line. And now I want to think about you as being something like C, like EG, U is C without a whole bunch of things. So in particular, I want to assume that there's a lot of non vanishing. I want to assume that um, regular functions, there's a lot of invertible regular functions on U. Okay, so this is, let's say, assume that this is B. Whatever. Okay, so a lot of invertible functions. Now, giving a trivialization of this line bucket. Is giving any element inside that. So trivializations look like this. So imagine there's a whole bunch of different trivializations. So these are all elements in. And we, can just, we can imagine those red ones don't intersect the black ones. Yeah, exactly. So somehow I've deleted a heap of points for you. And so I've got all these. these Functions from here over. Yep. Now, each of these functions is a perfectly reasonable choice of generator of my vector like basis of my vector yep. There's nothing in algebraic geometry that tells me that this is better than this. So, if you just look at that, you can see that there's no reasonable way of saying something is flat unless I tell you the division. There's nothing in algebraic geometry that tells me, I mean, nothing in Hartshorn will tell me that this is flat. Okay. Um, another example, so that's, yeah. I want to argue that flatness is extra structure. So this is example one. Example two, I think it's funny, is if we take all of n on D1. Okay, so the two charts, two standard charts, I have A1 about zero, A1 that would be. And now in this line bundle, if I take one, the constant vector. And then I transport it over to here. What do I get? To the negative now. Yeah, so this should have seconds. I will get it to the end. So let's say the coordinate here is x. And the coordinate here is y. When I transport it over here, I get. Like me, yeah, because I want. Uh, sorry, I, I'm. I want the integer to be 
So this is meant to be an illustration. So if that doesn't make sense to you, um, like you've got to do more exercise on people. Okay. You've got to know what ON is in order to follow this course. And if that doesn't make sense to you, you haven't done enough exercises yet. There's been like probably 10 discussions on Slack about ON. Been great one, yeah? And also like understanding text many forms. So like if you don't understand me like drawing stuff on the board and you prefer to read harsh or whatever, that's also fine. Yeah. But if you don't know what I'm gonna call it, you're gonna have trouble. Okay, so and this is like this is another example. This this kind of looks flat, yeah. And then I move to another chart, it doesn't look flat at all. Okay, and this is there's another exercise. Great exercise, um, which is to show that. You know, O is the only um, O of N that has a structure of the left demon. And essentially, the reason is this phenomenon. Yeah. Okay, so that's enough right now. So the goal now, I want to explain the demon is a quasi coherent sheet. Yeah. We can differentiate. Question. Sure. Where's their left nest? That picture. I mean, I, I've I've been asking myself the same question, but I I think it's the like it, there's something special in the way that we set up um, the definition of B modules in that we so if you think about B X, then Vector fields are a left OX submodule, but they're not a right OX submodule. Okay. And I think basically this is the this is where we put leftness in the story. Yeah. But that's a very good question and we should be thinking about it. Okay, so this is the, the slogan, and I just want you to um Keep that in the back in the back of your mind. So now I want to go over the connections. So uh, so if we have the vector bundle, we can associate uh, M. It's a um, loaded prediction. And we have V of the connected model with X, and this is an uh, this is an OX one. Okay. And these two notions are equivalent, and they become so equivalent in our geometry that often we just identify them. So now a uh, connection on here. So this is a very important concept. Is a C linear mass. So, in particular, it's not a OX linear. M. So, Alan explaining what the shape of one point is. So, this is typically the method. Now, what? Satisfying. Lattice rule, namely that nabla and f times n is g a and n plus x. Okay, so this is not OX linear. If it was OX linear, then it would just come straight out. So f does come out, but there's this cost of applying the This is what a connection. Is 
Uh, and basically, the connection is so if we're given, so basically, one should think about a connection as being a way of differentiating sections where we've just written as kind of one of them. So given the vector field phi. So remember, it's, it's really useful to think that like one form is things that each vector field would produce numbers. So if we're given a vector field of psi, we can um, go from him by another. Him. And now we can go by x psi tensor one to the OX. Yeah, so I have a vector field, so this e to the one form and produces a, a function. Yeah. Um, and we, and we uh, Note the composition by an and this is the covariant theorem. And what one should think is that so I have a section in my vector bundle, and now I have um, produced a way of differentiating that section in a particular way. And this um, it's affiliated by, which I won't say as it is, but is this that of the Where you can imagine what like this would mean. Uh, now, so we haven't said what uh, flatness means. Oh, so just, I'll just say two remarks. So alternatively, what we could say is okay, what we want to do is differentiate a section. And so you can imagine that you have a whole bunch of these aside a section. But then, so this would be a totally valid way of thinking about differentiating sections of vector bubble. But somehow like a connection is a very convenient way of packaging packages. All of these into one. And the second thing, so that's the last one. The second remark is that there's no reason to actually think that M is locally free. There's no, there's no. So if I want the definition makes sense. So everything that we put above. Any kind of code. And what we'll end up seeing is that uh, once we impose one more condition, namely flatness, this this object, so a locally free sheet together with the connection, is exactly the same thing. So if we have a connection, this is the connection. We get a map from I forms of X tensor. We get something like the Durand matrix. Via. Now we're in is and the rule in cap in you know whenever you're working with forms is you count the number of ways you have to move something through forms, and that gives you minus one for the whatever. So that you get minus one for five. 
And now um, this connection is flat. If and only if. So it's definition strange. If an atlas squared is zero as a map from um, and maybe an optional exercise is if lambda is flat. Then we get the complex. Okay, so the the trivial connection on the trivial bundle gives us exactly the algebraic triangle of X. Of X. Now, so that's an optional exercise, a very good exercise. X is flat if and only if. So this should hark back to the so in the Riemannian case we saw that uh, um, that this parallel transform would be trivial if and only if these covariant derivatives commute and this is basically saying the same thing. This is saying that we have um, that our covariant derivatives commute as long as the little brackets are zero. So that's the important exercise. And then uh, maybe should we have a break? Yeah, so let's have a break. So let's assume so x is fine. So now I just want to explain very briefly why it is the case that a D module is the same or equivalent to a quasi coherent sheet with flat connection. So a D module is just a quasi coherent sheet where it makes sense to differentiate sections. And what's kind of interesting about that is that, so somehow we know this connection language from differential geometry where you deal with vector bundles. And the interesting thing that happens with D modules is the ability to differentiate sections where your quasi coherent chief is no longer a vector bundle that comes in screaming tower. So you can kind of differentiate sections into the singularities of your space. Okay. We'll see examples later. So I just want to explain the point. So D and so corollary of Allen's vectors, uh, Allen's vector, and also if you'd like to see if we'll start up, so he literally has the statement from proposition 2.2. So on the website, there are several references, um, including these notes of uh, Merchant Mustafa from Michigan. So, um, dx, uh, so this is the ring differential operators in x, so that this is at one skew. Uh, dx has a presentation. We generate this. So Alan said a very similar statement um, from which this statement is producible. We have generated f tilde. Uh, and side to the function, where f is a regular function and psi is a vector field, and relations. So remember that we think about f as being the endomorphism of functions which are given by multiplication by f. And psi is being the endomorphism of functions which are functions which are given by the um, derivation. So F times G is going to be natural. Um, the commutator of psi tilde and F tilde is psi. And so here I just take formal symbols corresponding to functions and vector fields. These are all relations that are satisfied. If I send f tilde to the endomorphism of O of x given by multiplication by f, I also have the 
derivation is given by psi. And then the claim is that this is, in fact, enough relations. So this implies, so whenever you have a presentation by something via generators and relations, it's easy to give a module over that thing, or at least easy in principle, because you can just specify a whole lot of operations and check these relations. So what this implies is that um, the D module M, and the DX module M, is the same thing as a composite coherent um, corresponding. Together with that looks like satisfying this relation. I.e., we want to reduce, so we have our fuzzy figure in module M, and so we know how to multiply by functions, and then we have this operator. And we want that is and And so these are exactly the same rules as having a covariant and ability to derive. So now um, chasing through root, chasing on the root. Now there's an exercise, right? Which I think is Absolutely not. So that the DX module M, which is coherent, is. So I think this is a really amazing thing that first shows you that having extra structure on a on a module has serious consequences. This has serious consequences for kind of having energy. Okay. Do you have a question? No. You were just randomly holding your finger up in there? I was passing this So we have a DX module. So all of our DX modules, we're probably always assuming that our so they're always something like quasi, so they're always always quasi coherent with our audience. Okay, so they live in the land of algebraic geometry. But if we impose a condition which is that they're coherent, it's very natural in algebraic geometry. Suddenly it immediately becomes a vector problem. So this is hard. So one. Not easy. But um, and do case of a one first. Now I just want to do a really trivial case, firstly, which is to ask. So let let x be a one. I'm just doing this essentially for entertainment purposes. Right? This is not really instructional. So this general technical knowledge, but it's just amusing. Okay. So x is a one. So O of x is polynomial ring one over here. And the classic example of a coherent sheet is C x modulo x. Okay. So here's step of x. Here's the other line. And then I have this. This is the skyscraper sheet at this point. 
Now, the question is that, that I would like you to answer. Remember, yeah. So does this I'm going to do an annoying thing, which is to wait until someone says something. Well, it's not locally free, <laughs> so probably not. So it doesn't, okay, unless the exercise is made it wrong, yeah, which is possible, but pretty sure the exercise is correct. So it doesn't have a new expression, but why doesn't it? Because the fibers look very different over different points. So it sort of looks the opposite of something that could have parallel transport. Like, like yeah. not, not a proof, but you know, I would want all my fibers to look the same if I had a notion of parallel transport and one fiber is clearly different. That's my best. Yeah, so I think that's very that's very good, like basic intuition. But we will see D models that are entirely supported at a single point later on. And so it has X killing it. So it's like you differentiate x times one on d by dx, you would get one, but you know, so it should be zero. So, so we have this section gamma, yeah, which is our only non zero section. Yeah? So this is one in one. So I think Alex is just now, but that wasn't what I had in mind, but let's see. So you're saying that x differentiate x times gamma, x times gamma is zero. Differentiate that along d by dx. Okay, so now we differentiate this. So we get zero equals d and x times gamma, which is d of x, which is one times gamma, which is gamma plus x times d of gamma, whatever that is, but that's zero. And now you have gamma is equal to zero. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so you know this, whatever this is, this has to be an island of x. Because yeah, everything in the model is not that not by x. So this is zero. And so this is yellow. Okay, excellent. That wasn't the argument I had in mind, but it's very good for me. Yeah. Um, another argument is so we have this relation three x is one. Okay. And this algebra has no finite dimensional roots. So the simple reason that the trace of the commutator is zero and the trace of the identity is the dimension of your vector space. So this has no dimension. And I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to do these simple examples to get a feel for d modules. So another exercise is, is there a d module supported at zero? Okay. And in fact, we've already seen one. So, and you know, how, how does one escape the prison of that sort of argument? It's interesting. Okay. So, I want to really like um, emphasize coordinates for a second because I think it's useful. So, I think for the rest of the um, lecture, I, I just wanted to kind of take a very intense coordinate point of view on connections, do some examples, and then I want to explain how to pull back the connection, do some examples, and then we'll be done. And then I'll explain pullback of um, D modules next time. So, coordinates are useful. So, let's assume that M is locally free. So, M is locally free. One thing that I kind of keep meaning to say, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you said, is that if you look at differential operators on non smooth things, they can have very pathological behavior. For example, they're not necessarily in our theory things. And so that's why we always achieve this smoothness. I will explain later on how to make sense of D modules on singular. Singular spaces, but you always make sense of them in terms of embedding such things. So we have M is uh, locally free with its spaces. And so and we have a connection. So this is something that 
But if you expand this out using our basis, what, what we get is it's a map from O to X. You can. So this is taking out of X. Two. One. Place. So in other words, is an N by N matrix of some. And it's really uh, nice to, so here's a, a good exercise. I think it's really important to be able to go between. So, you know, often we'll meet D modules that are locally free. And so you can just write them down as an N by N matrix of one form. And you need to be used to how to do it. So, this is the exercise. So, that our favorite D modules on X equals um, D star given by. So in the first lecture, I introduced the D module corresponding to positive function, the exponential function, then the lambda. And, and now, so these D modules are ranked one, 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 and two. And so what I, what we need to do is write down a one by one matrix of one forms, one by one, one by one, one by one, and I claim that they're given by a one. So zero times D Z is the one that corresponds to one. One times dz is the one corresponding to uh, x. Lambda the inverse times dz is the one corresponding to this dude. And this guy is zero, zero, getting the zero. I'm wondering if I should leave that as an exercise or I should explain it. Basically, like maybe a tiny bit of explanation. So let's assume that our D module is generated. Gamma. Then if we do D gamma. Then we basically we should get the the d gamma is equal to this matrix times gamma. Okay, so for example, here we get d gamma is zero times gamma, i.e. d gamma is constant. Here we get here we get d gamma is one times gamma, i.e. gamma is the exponential part. That's how it goes today. And now some more exercises. Then load in three is above, or even three is above with fixed basis. So one, describe, and suppose we have a connection. So I, at some point, I remember I was going to a lecture at Ginsburg in Göttingen, and he was lecturing in the so called Hilbert space. Um, which is the last it's the lecture hall that Hilbert gave his last lecture in. And they didn't, they've never put lights in the room to honor Hilbert's tradition. And at some point, someone asked Ginsburg a question and he said, I'd love to answer that, but I can't. There's no more light. So let's continue tomorrow. Uh, okay. So describe the okay. So I have a matrix and I change basis. How does that, how does my connection matrix change? And you discover like a really, really important relation um, in lots of maths and mathematical physics called gauge points. There's some beautiful mix of algebra and analysis. Um, 
So this I really like. So determine the norm for for a connection from the trivial bundle. Um, X, which is trivial line bundle, on X, which is spec C. Okay, so here I have with this. And you can ask, you know, are there interesting connections on a trivial line bundle of this infinitesimal disk? And it turns out the answer is yes. There are very interesting ones. And you already see a kind of wild world. So you already see something very interesting in this very simple example. Um, this is less important option. Okay. Um, so that Napa is flat is equivalent to another famous equation. So as um, Nick correctly remarked, before when I talked about flatness, I said there's this map going twice, and we want that map to be zero. Yep. This map from M to um, two forms tends to M. But if you ask yourself what that map is, it's a repackaging of the Riemann curvature test. So flatness is exactly saying that the curvature of the connection is zero. Okay, and then you can rephrase it in terms of this condition. Okay, which is, again, it mixes algebra and the other. Okay, so now I'll just start um, the motivation for the next thing. So, if you want to do one exercise from this lecture, please do this. Uh, okay, so now uh, I just want to explain briefly pullback of connections, and uh, next week we'll do functors in general. But what's the motivation? So, much of the power. So you have complicated variety X. You've got no hope of understanding it, but you can map to some slightly simpler variety and understand how they relate to that. And there's an enormous amount of, so, you know, if you think about Grothendieck's kind of philosophy, it's really studying the relationships between objects rather than one single object at a time. And the relationships between objects come from the morphisms. So we want to be able to, and this turns out to be a tricky business. So another another motivation is imagine that so imagine that I have a map from x, a map from x to y, and imagine that I have some functions alpha i um, satisfied. What equations okay, so this is a very important basic question. Imagine that, for example, I have some family of functions of y, and then they satisfy some nice differential equations. Imagine I pull them back to x, what differential equations do they satisfy on x? Very natural thing. Another thing that I might, for example, this map, it might make sense to push forward functions along here. So I might, for example, have this might be a proper map and I might be able to integrate along the fibers, produce a function down here. Or this would just be a finite map and I might be able to sum over the fibers, produce a function down here. And what equations, what differential equations are those push forward? Those? Well, they're very natural. Yeah? So it's a very natural question. And I think it's very natural that we should try to push forward and pull back the molecules. But why is it tricky? Tricky though. The reason is basically that functions are contrary 
and vector fields are closure. So you can make sense to push forward a vector field, make sense to pull back a different form, it makes sense to pull back a function. And so somehow there's this like mix of contravariant and covariant that makes things very complicated. And when we come to see characteristic variety, we'll see that another reason for the difficulty of pushing forward and pulling back theme modules is that if I have a map from X to Y, I have no natural map between their code and Another manifestation of same Okay. So it's tricky. But pulling back connections. So I think it's it's really lovely to so yeah, as I said before, I somehow didn't realize this before that it's so much easier to pull back connections. So we're just doing formal nonsense, yeah. So D module connection is just formal nonsense. But sometimes when you do formal nonsense, things get easier. Um, so why is it so easy to pull back the connection? So imagine that I have a map from X to Y. Then I have a map on functions, and I have a map so I can pull back on functions. So connection matrix. So just as fun, let's pull back each of these. And I think this is an incredibly enlightening real okay, That's tricky. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's clear, I hope it's clear what I'm doing. Yes, so I have this connection on, on C star, and I have this map that sends uh, X to X to the N. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull back these connections. And what we're going to see is that we get another connection which exactly describes the differential equation satisfied by the formats of that function of the So we introduce, uh, so here we're calling them coordinate in there. I should put on the text. So in other words, what we're setting is. Then it's equal to x to the n. And this means that b then is n x to the n one point. So this guy pulls it back to zero times. I'll just do it in full detail. The x, which is a positive zero times. So indeed, if we pull back the this connection, we get the connection satisfied by the pullback function of that is kind of trivial in case. This one, if you pull back, we get m x the m minus one is x. And this is the differential equation satisfied. <laughs> By e to the x. We pull this one back, and something is weird, it's kind of very interesting what happened in here. Here we see the kind of this so called Hooksian condition. I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. So here we go to lambda x to the minus 10 times. M X to the M minus one. 
And we in the same computation shows that we get zero, zero, and Um, now, this is exactly satisfied by the and this is satisfied by uh, I just want to do one more example, which is what this one looks at looks like at infinity. So if we consider uh e to the z inverse, this satisfies the equation with d of b of z inverse. With minus x to minus two b. So the inverse. So the connection matrix is uh, minus x to minus two b. And if you pull this back, you get uh, minus x to minus two. So this is just so this is meant to convince you that pulling back connection is easy. But also I think that you can see like very beautiful stuff going on. So this one, last time we somewhat explained the monotony of this is the exponential of um two pi i lambda. So now when we pull back the monotony of this one is now um exponential of n times so two pi i m length so the, the monogram is being unwound by n so if you think about like if you think about the square root function then it has monogram minus one and if you pull it back under a two-fold bar it becomes true and this is exactly what happens here and if you think about pulling back the log function under this thing you just get a, a set of multiple itself and so it satisfies the same differential equation when you pull back you can't make it better by pulling yeah. And also, you can see that this connection is just equivalent to the one we started off by a simple change of equation. And also, you see here this kind of crucial Hooksian condition, which is you have like a whole of one minus one, so a whole of one one, but not more. Notice that the magic that happens here that this Hooksian condition is preserved when we pull out. But if we do a little bit worse, so this is not Hooksian. But just a little bit less than Suddenly, this pullback gets worse and worse and worse. And so, if you um, so like at some point in this course, we'll be banging on a lot about regular singularities, and regular singularities is to do with this Hooksian condition being satisfied. So, an example is here. I said, like in the first lecture, I said X is bad because it doesn't have regular singularities in it. And here we see that it's not full city and you get it Um yeah, I lost my kind of thought, but yeah, so I hope I could convince you that pulling back connections is natural and fun and have hopefully enlightening. And then next week we will do pulling back and pushing forward general D modules, and it really becomes very painful very quickly. So um 
get used to some like next week will be painful. <laughs>